Well, family, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Ronnie Galvin, I'm Managing Director uh, at the Greater Washington Community Foundation. Um, I uh, help lead our community investment team, which um, uh, works with our competitive and discretionary grant making. I'm also uh, helping to lead with my colleagues uh, the new racial equity and inclusion work. I shouldn't say new, um, picking up um, our, our legacy for racial equity and inclusion, really advancing that in a powerful way and working with Tonya, um, our board um, and other folks um, in our network to launch our new strategic plan, um, which centers on the racial wealth gap, closing the racial wealth gap uh, and doing that in specific neighborhoods around the region. Thank y'all for joining us again. Uh, this is our third uh, community book group session. Uh, if you remember, we started in January or February this year, uh, reading Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Wilkerson. Um, I think it was in July, we read uh, Heather McGee's uh, The Sum of Us, What Racism uh, Cost Everyone and How We Can Solve It Together. And this third session um, isn't so much uh, about, a, uh, uh, about a book, uh, but it's more about a, uh, a topic uh, and a, uh, a set of uh, articles that Michelle Singletary um, uh, wrote in the Washington Post about matters related to race and uh, the economy. Um, she recently spoke um, at a meeting uh, we held for our funders and investment advisors. Uh, many of you who are on this call were in that uh, uh, meeting and we wanted to create a space to dialogue more deeply and more closely about uh, uh, the intersection of race and economy, particularly as uh, Ms. Singletary was laying out her argument in the 10 part series in our annual meeting. So we'll do some of that today. Again, thank y'all uh, for joining us for this third uh, book group. Before we get too deep into it, I want to uh, bring uh, uh, Tonya Wellens, our president and CEO to the microphone to just share a little bit about what we've been up to at the foundation and the context that this conversation about race and economy is happening in. Tony, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Ronnie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is really a pleasure to be in this space with you this morning. And thank you, Ronnie, for your leadership and commitment in you know, putting the book club into, uh, into action and to driving our, our racial equity agenda uh, with so much energy, really appreciate you. Um, I wanna start again by saying a huge thank you to all of you for joining us this morning. Um, last year, as many of you know, we uh, spent many, many months on emergency response work, dispersing more than 40 million in resources, helping people and communities who were in the greatest of need. And immediately following a really intense period, our team and our trustees went directly into strategic planning. Uh, the trifecta of crises, you all have heard me say this before, the global health pandemic, the ensuing economic crisis, and the cause for racial and social justice, along with a deep re-examining of ourselves, led our board of trustees to approving an ambitious 10-year strategic vision for a just and equitable Greater Washington region. So our North Star is to close the racial wealth gap in the Greater Washington region. It's ambitious, it's bold, uh, we can't do it alone, which is why we are engaging members of our community to learn with us um, about the strategies to address the racial wealth gap, to close the racial wealth gap, and to create a just and equitable greater Washington region. Our strategy is organized around seven institutional goals and three strategic pillars. So the strategic pillars, we are, naming an explicit commitment to leading with racial equity. As Ronnie noted, we have um, done racial equity work, um, done social justice work over the last many years, I'd say even since the days of, of Terry Freeman. Um, but I don't know that we had an explicit institutional commitment to racial equity, and now we do. We've committed to aligning our business with our values. And this includes you know, the products that we will offer to the efforts that we will fund, to how we will invest our resources. We're moving to a do no harm, do the absolute most good um, with all elements of our business. 
And because we sit in a, what I, I refer to often as the intersection of racialized wealth and racialized poverty, our North Star again is to close the racial wealth gap in our region. So you can go to the next slide. Our operating theory of change, and we are still working to, um, to get the, the language right and to, to normalize language internally, so please bear with me. But our operating theory of change is when the economic mobility and wealth prospects change for black and brown people in the most underinvested neighborhoods, the jurisdictions that house them will change. And so does the entire region. So I'll say that again, because I know it's a mouthful. When the economic mobility and wealth prospects change for black and brown people in the most underinvested neighborhoods, the jurisdictions that house them will change and so does the entire region. So another uh, key emphasis of our strategy is uh, it's around placed-based strategies, placed-based investments, which you will hear more about in the months ahead and um, which we are really excited about the shift. So that's all I can say now, because if I talk about the strategy, we'll be here <laughs> all day. And I don't wanna take up the important time diving deep um, on the, the 10 part series with Michelle Singletary. I appreciate if many of you had the chance to listen in on the interview during our annual meeting. Um, and I, I really want to thank you for being brave in this discussion with us today. You know, we are discussing two of the most, two of the four, I think there are four taboo topics in, in this country, and we're discussing two of them today, race and wealth. So without more uh, remarks from me, I'd like to turn it back over to, to Ronnie again. Thank you for being brave with us today. Thank you, Tonya, and thanks for um, uh, helping us kind of set the context at least from the foundation's perspective, uh, that this conversation and future conversations um, is happening in. Just real quickly before we uh, take a deep breath and we pivot toward the meat of our um, conversation today, um, just wanted to uh, make sure we were centered on what we are uh, hoping to achieve uh, uh, today during our conversation and dialogue. First of all, we want to build um, an informed and aligned community around the greater issues affecting um, our region. And uh, we believe that uh, the racial wealth gap in particular is um, uh, a catalytic, perhaps the most single, uh, most catalytic issue that we could be working on at this particular moment. Um, so we want to become more informed and aligned. And when we talk about building community, we're talking about um, cross-racial, cross-sector, and cross-jurisdictional, um, building our muscles for dialoguing, imagining, and taking action uh, together. Um, secondly, we want to give voice to the reflections and questions that uh, many of you might be holding about Michelle Singletary's 10-part uh, Washington Post series on race and the economy. Um, she also um, spoke at, uh, as Tonya said, um, our meeting with our investors. And, um, and so we wanna, we didn't have a whole lot of time during that meeting to reflect um, on um, some of the comments Michelle made. And so we wanna use that space here to do that. And then of course, um, as I said earlier, we want to preview and extend an invitation to continue this journey with us as we are um, right now in the process of designing a cross-racial, cross-sector cohort to understand and take action uh, on the racial wealth gap uh, in the region. So that's uh, what we're up to. And, you know, um, I know many of us participate in uh, book talks. So, uh, sometimes you read the books closely. <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, uh, you, you skim over, uh, you make it through a few chapters. Um, However you're coming to the conversation today, um, whether you read it closely, you skimmed over or didn't read it at all, um, we know that we all have a perspective and we're all trying to really get our arms and minds around these issues of race and economy, um, hopefully in a new way. And so what um, we're, I thought we would start this morning just as a way to kind of uh, maybe uh, provoke our memories and our thoughts about the subject, 
um, of race and economy. Um, I lifted, since I have the editor's pen, um, just some key kind of um, quotes and questions that, um, that um, I found as compelling in Michelle's article. And I'm gonna, articles, and I'm gonna actually just kind of flash them on the screen slowly so that um, we can kind of take them all in uh, together. Then after that, my colleague, um, Darcel Wilson, who runs our um, uh, Prince George's office, is gonna uh, invite us into just kind of a, a 10 minute kind of quick, what's coming up for folks? What are some other things you re remember about Michelle's uh, piece or other comments you have about the subject of race in the economy? So here we go. So, and I'll read these as we go through, through them. How do we convey our private thoughts about racial injustice? when we've been trained to be silent, polite, and led to believe that color doesn't matter. And all these again came from Michelle's 10 part series. Black people don't like talking about race because it's risky. Black people don't like talking about race because it's risky. And a uh, parenthetical remark, and we ain't the only ones who aren't uh, comfortable talking about race. Racism by its very nature is theft. It steals opportunities from those who have the capacity but are denied a real chance at success. Half the battle for better race relations could be won if we all would simply listen with an open heart. Home ownership doesn't deliver the same wealth for Blacks as it does for whites. The federal government created a caste system that has denied families of color the opportunity to build wealth. The enduring impact of slavery. the enduring impact of slavery. The enduring impact of slavery. The destruction of African families was a key element in the wealth equation for America. Black lives were the foundation upon which the nation was built. Black people are entitled to reparations. We've earned them. The case we are making isn't about individual guilt. It's about national responsibility. So sit with that for a second. I wanna to add to the hopper of our imaginations. Um, a couple of clips from our meeting where Tonya was actually talking with Michelle um, about these issues of race and economy. All right, the share screen and sound here. Sound. Can y'all see that? Andy, I can see you. Andy, can you see that? You're on mute. Yes, I can. Okay, all right, let me do this. When I graduated, I've only rented one year in my life. I've been a homeowner since I was about 22 years oh, old wow. because of a first time home buyers program, right? That gave me money to buy a home in my own community. And what did I do with that when I was able to get a home at such a young age? That I was able to keep a lot of my resources because my rent wasn't always going up. 
I could take care of my disabled brother. So I had a place for him. He came to live with me. I lifted us up. So mm -hmm. it's the totality of these programs that makes a difference. You mentioned in one of the articles um, about home ownership and the valuation of um, of properties that are in black neighborhoods yeah. and properties that are in non-black neighborhoods. We didn't, that wasn't one of our prep planned questions, but I know that you have a lot to say about that. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot to say about a lot of things. <laughs> so, you know, my husband and I wanted to live in our own community, um, and we bought a house in Prince George's community, uh, uh, Prince George's County. We actually looked at Montgomery County because, you know, better schools and things like that, but we could not afford those houses there. We could afford a house in Prince George's community, and it was closer to my church. Yeah. If you picked my house up and moved it to Montgomery County, it'd be probably worth 30 or 40 percent more. Wow. So when we talk about those statistics of wealth, the difference between black wealth and wealth, white wealth, we frame it as if somehow blacks are not handling their money well. Mm -hmm. So we look at that number and it's like people think, oh, that's cash in the bank or investments, when actually it's equity, right. you know, home equity. So if their houses appreciate more than ours, mm -hmm. same house, you know, same structure. I got ducks in my neighborhood, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. and deer right outside my window. But same house, a white ho homeowner house is appreciating at a greater rate. Their wealth is creating. Mine is stagnant. Right. That is where the difference comes. And why is my stagnant? Because of redlining. And white families don't want to move into my community. Why don't they want to move into my community and be my neighbors because of the color of my skin? Because they think, oh, well, there's going to be crime and I'm not going to be able to sell at the same rate. And so it's sort of like a chicken egg thing. And, and so home ownership is so important mm -hmm. because even though our homes don't appreciate, it does stabilize neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And, be, and I might, I'm not pulling that equity out of my home, but because I have a home, there are people in my family that have a home. My husband and I have always had people come live with us right. who are you know, not doing as well so that we can lift them up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for uh, expounding on that. Uh and then one more um, clip. And I think those of you who were at the annual meeting um, remember this poignant moment. As you can see here, I'm having a little trouble with the, there we go. But I wrote a story about my great, great, great grandmother who was enslaved um, and the, 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 why I think reparations applies. Um, do I have time to tell a quick story? You do, please. So uh, her name was Leah Drumright. She was enslaved, and she worked in the big house. She was, and she was a wet nurse. So she mm. nursed a white woman's owner's baby, and at the, she had a baby at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the white owner, female owner, said to my great great grandmother that you can only breastfeed your child on your right breast, uh. and you can only breastfeed my child on the left breast because that's closer to the heart and mm. that milk is better. Wow. And she couldn't switch them up. But one night, working in the kitchen, and these are stories that were passed down from my family. My grandmother told me this. One night, Leah, so exhausted, was nursing her own child mm. on her own left breast. The white owner came in, her owner came in, and she uh, slapped her and then beat her for breastfeeding her own child. Right. So that's what reparation is about. So she took away, it's the ability to feed her own child, mm -hmm. took away our ability to earn. Why are so many black men in prison? Because there was a point in history where they would round up black men mm -hmm. to send them to jail so they could work on the farms that they were uh, freed from. And so there then became a history of putting blacks in jail because then they could farm them out without paying them to white farm owners and, and businesses. Mm. So when you look at the history and you have to look at that, that gives you a different perspective about why there's so much crime in the black community. Mm. It doesn't mm. excuse people. But once you know it and put it in perspective, it makes a difference. And so that reparations. And so, but, but as I explained it like that, mm -hmm. I was getting feedback, but like I didn't think about it that way. When I wrote about microaggressions, the things that people say, like, and you probably experienced mm -hmm. this, oh, you speak so well. Yep. <laughs> but the last part of that sentence is for, for a black person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't say it. Yeah. That's microaggression. Yeah. 
I have a subscription to Arena Stage. And one, <laughs> there was a multiracial uh, production of Oklahoma, which I love. My husband and I love theater. Mm -hmm. We were sitting in the front row. We have a premium subscription. I save my money. We love the theater. We want to have great seats. And we're sitting in the front row. At intermission, a white woman comes down to me. She leans over and she says, oh my gosh, you must know, how did you get these seats? You must know someone in the production. Mm. There was a white person sitting on my, this side and a white person sitting on the side. And I, why would you ask me that? Like, I can't afford these seats on my own. And my husband, ever so, <laughs> the peacemaker, he just puts his hand on me. He says, let it go. Mm. But what you're saying with what you guys want to do is we can no longer. Right let it go. We can no longer ignore it. We can no longer yeah. ignore it. And we have to use our philanthropy differently. We do. Okay. Can y'all hear me? So, um, so just trying to set the frame, kind of remind us of what was in the 10-part uh, series, acknowledging uh, edit I had editor's pen. Y'all may have had other things that provoked you um in that series and then sharing for many of you who weren't with us at our investors meeting um uh, so just out of michelle's mouth directly as tonya was kind of guiding her in that interview process um you know some content to kind of like fuel our conversation today so um want to invite y'all to sit with that i have lots of questions and i've been waiting on the edge of my seat to be in this space with this community to talk about this. Um, but before we do all of that, I wanna invite uh, my partner, colleague, comrade, freedom fighter, um, agitator and community builder, and by the way, fundraiser, uh, Darcel Wilson, who's been with us probably just 30 or 40 days now, um, That's right. Forty days French, in. Yep. Running. Forty our days Jordan's in. Office. This is yeah. my first uh, book club. Uh, I'm really happy to be on board at this pivotal time in the history of the Community Foundation. Um, some really thought-provoking clips. Some really thought-provoking statements that were shared. Um, that were shared, and um, just want to take a few minutes to get some of your initial thinking and thoughts um, just from viewing those clips and uh, reactions to the statements that Ronnie read at the beginning. And if I need to start it off a little bit for you, one of the thoughts um, that he read, racism is theft. And I know there was much more to that sentence, theft of opportunity. Um, that really resonates with me because uh, being a, a military daughter and wife, having uh, lived out in and out of the country and around the uh, world for the first 35 years of my life, I've had the rich opportunity to interact with folks from all walks of life, from all races, from all ethnic backgrounds. But the way we live in this country oftentimes robs us of those opportunities. So that's my, one of my takeaways in this early part. Any, anybody else wanna share? Any initial thoughts, feelings? Unique? Yeah, happy, happy to jump in. Um, grateful for this space and um, those comments. They were really, most of them really struck a chord with me. And um, there was one though that I'm really struggling with. I wonder if I could offer here. It's the one, I don't remember exactly what it read, but it was the one about listening. Like mm -hmm. most of our challenges could be solved or something like that if we listened to each with other. With an open heart, I believe that yeah, was the last part of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I, I used to believe <laughs> things like that. Um, it's why we at our foundation, if a foundation for radical possibility supported lots of trainings and lots of opportunities for people to get in rooms together, just like this one actually, um, to listen and talk. And um, I think that there is value in that. I'm not saying that there isn't value, um, but 
I learned so much from reading Ibram Kendi's uh, Stamped from the Beginning. Um, and I am, I am now a convert. I, I believe that this is really about uh, power, um, benefit, and privilege that folks are not giving up. <laughs> They're not giving that up because they now know the truth. Um, I, I don't believe that the change will happen because of hearts and minds changing. I just, I just don't believe that. I, I, I think people can listen. I think people can know racism hurts and still hold on to benefits that privilege them. Um, and so that, you know, I'll just close by saying that reminds me of um, uh, what Frederick Douglass said and still reminds us that power concedes nothing without a demand, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, never has, never will. And so I, I, I think we have to be really careful with those kinds of statements. They have value, listening has value, but it doesn't have the value that I think we have given it um, in, in the struggle for, for racial justice. Thank you, Yannick. I see the hand of Brittany Owens. Hey, um, thank you. I just also, one thing that has been, I guess, coming through my mind as I've been listening and reading the different statements is that slavery, racism, and everything has affected or impacted generations. There are certain things like, you know, as far as speaking up and stuff like that. And I'm just going back to, there was times, you know, where people are being killed for speaking their minds. And we have even seen like last summer with protesters being greeted with, you know, tear gas and other things versus other people can storm the Capitol. I wonder if safety is a thing, even when I think about like generations not being able to swim or all these other things. I do like the concept of we need to speak more. I also just wanna know if one of the reasons why we haven't been as actively speaking may have been some previous events that we've heard or we've seen whether it's through the media or family stories and things like that. I may be a little bit off from the direction we're going. I'm, that's just stuff that's automatically coming to my head, just thinking about that. Thanks. Thank you for that, Brittany. Anybody else, any other initial thoughts, feelings? I would, can I jump in? Sure, Susan, please. Um, playing off those a little bit and sort of what I was thinking before as a, a white woman of a certain age, um, the issue of reparations. And I don't remember when I first heard it a long time ago. And I will say I did not get it despite, um, despite having grown up in a very integrated community and thinking that I was well-educated. So I will say that um, things I have learned over the years have definitely changed my thinking. Um, I don't, I, I guess I thought I was well informed before, you know, but I mean, just specific things like um, GI Bill. Mm -hmm. I had no idea until very recently that the GI Bill was only for white GIs. I don't know, you know, it's just um, things that we were not taught in school and things that didn't come up other places. So I don't know that talking and listening is enough, but I will say certainly from my perspective, I have learned and I have changed my perspective on things because I see the bigger, the, the fuller impact than I, than I truly ever got before. Thank you for that, Susan. Uh, Diane Bernstein. Diane, I see your hand up. Hi, I'm sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button. Okay. And, um, there's, there's just chaos here. So I'm in the background, so I'm keeping my camera off. Um, yeah, the, um, so what was said earlier about um, power and power doesn't concede, I, I agree. And as a white woman, I'm sorry, my camera's off. Um, but as a white woman, as the child of um, those who escaped the Holocaust, um, I, I didn't get the concept of reparations for, for a while. And, but that the framing that um, when you look at 
post-World War II Germany, um, Germany and Austria and the payouts that my relatives received. I have a relative that was receiving payouts from Austria until she passed away three years ago. Mm. And right. And you look at this country and world war and you just think about the aftermath of the civil war and monuments and sharecropping. And yes, the North won the war. Slavery, slavery was illegal. Mm -hmm. And yet the white land owners maintained all the power. Um, and, and what I struggle with, what I struggle with is, is seeing that and putting that into context and saying, oh my gosh, yes, look at the legacy that that has created. We are a democracy. We do have this centralized government um, and, and state governments and nothing changes without the, the power, yes, economic power, yes, but also laws and elected officials. And, and we don't change laws or put laws into effect without a, my, a majority vote. And so I, I struggle with how to voice this and present this to my white counterparts who, I, I mean, I recall a, couple, a few years ago having a conversation with a, a neighbor who um, you know, came from white woman, came from modest means, her and her husband have worked hard. Their kids were facing college. They had worked very, very hard to save, to be able to give their, their daughter college choice. And she's listening to Bernie Sanders talk about free college and making college so much more affordable. And her frustration in like, but wait a minute, I worked so hard all my life to do this. And, and now you're going to turn around and give those after me who haven't worked as hard this free ride. I don't, and I'm going to have to pay for that out of my taxes. And, and I understood her frustration. I just, I struggle for these words to say, but wait a minute, like you worked really hard and I don't want to take that away from you, but do you not see that some of your hard work was aided by luck and fate and who you knew and who your parents knew and who your neighbors were and who was in your public school or your parochial school. I mean, heck, you know, the, the Jewish girl in New England, I wasn't going to these fancy private schools and making the same connections that, um, not that we didn't lack for connections in our public school, but you know, I, I could look out and say, but wait, and when my father wanted to network at that golf club, he couldn't join that golf club, but you know, we all have, we all have these little subtle benefits. And then you get into the GI bill and redlining and, and all that. And I, I really struggle with how to help others see some of the injustice and that it's not about taking away what you have, but sharing. Mm -hmm that with others i'm sorry i spoke too long but that was... and i struggle for those words because <laughs> yeah i don't want to give my peers the out but i want to help them understand it as right it's there was another article we talked about i believe in an earlier book club how do you explain reparations to a broke white person <laughs> yeah right. Darcy, can i jump in can i jump yes. in real quick Yes. Because I, I see the hands going up. Mm -hmm. Throw your hands up. Throw your hands up. And um, <laughs> and we wanna we wanna save some for the small group discussion. So Darcel, uh, you understood the assignment, and everyone responded. And so um, we imagine that many folks are probably sitting on your own comments, thoughts, wrestling like the rest of us are with some of these things. And so we wanna pivot quickly to, uh, for about 15, 20 minutes to some small group discussions. Um, can y'all see that? And uh, members of the foundation staff will um, be there to help guide the conversation, but this is a conversation for us, right? If you notice, 
um, for our book groups, we don't bring the authors into the space to kind of give us a lecture and then we kind of sit there and have them pour into our heads. We are having the conversation amongst ourselves. And so, um, so we wanna invite you to really own this small group space. Emily, um, our colleague is gonna pivot us in a second. Here are just some questions to think about as we go into the space and you may not even need them. I, I feel the room warming up, but what, is, what else strikes you about Michelle's comments? Um, what will it take to activate our community's imagination and will to take action on these issues? Uh, what concerns you or scares you about this work? And are you ready to take action? And if so, what are you prepared to do? And then to the facilitators, as you go into the room, um, one question that came up for me as I was looking across at the gallery of faces that are on the call with us, why did you say yes to this invitation? And why do you wanna have this conversation? Why don't we open up with that question to kind of get us into the others? Um, why, why did you say yes to this invitation? And uh, uh, why are you in this conversation? Um, so let's start with that. I'm gonna stop sharing screen here. And Emily, I'm gonna invite you to go ahead and uh, put us in the rooms. We'll be there for about 15 or 20 minutes and uh, we'll bring you back for a more open discussion. Thanks to ourselves for leading that section. No problem. Ronnie, if I could just say one thing real quick. Please. In my yeah. particular group, um, there were recommendations of podcast and um, someone offered up, um, um, I believe it was Monica, a television show that she also watches. So I know at the start of this conversation, we talked about putting in books that everyone should read, but if anyone has any podcasts or any other articles or television shows or documentaries that will help to inform this work as well, feel free to put that in the chat. Yeah, I was writing down the all the books that people suggested at the beginning so that we can collect all of that. So if you guys wanna put stuff in the chat, I'll start jotting down a list again. Nice. Well, I know Rusella, the reason why Rusella, who's my colleague at the foundation jumped in with that is because she wanted to like uh, present her group as like the high achieving group. And they might've been high achieving, but as is always the case, whenever we come together on calls like this, my group is always the most lit group. Like we had the most fun in our group. I just wanna just tell y'all, I know that for certain without even hearing what y'all are talking about. Our, and it's not because of me, it's because of all the amazing folks that were in our group. So, um, so, right, so I know some of y'all have to leave. Uh, thank y'all for joining. So, so now uh, we wanna just pivot. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so, all right, so we just wanna pivot to have a, a kind of a plenary conversation about like what's coming up uh, for folks. Um, what kind of provoked you uh, as it relates, and Anna jump in here. Anna's gonna co-facilitate this section with me. What, uh, provoked you about Michelle's article? Why are you in this conversation? Uh, we had a lot of conversation about that in this group. What scares you? So just, just let's just open the mic and do what you do in book group. Let's just talk to each other. I'd like to say that for the past couple of years, I've really been, uh, reading, studying, every organization I'm involved in is uh, <clears throat> doing a, a racial equity training. And um, yes, I have a lot of ideas and yes, I know a lot, but what am I supposed to do now with all that information? I think that was a, a little bit of a theme in our group is this feeling of <clears throat> being trapped between a little bit trapped between two worlds of being, being educating ourselves as um I think we're all except for andy andy had to drop off it was a group of all white women so feel like of educating ourselves of being overwhelmed and of us several of us talked about how we were raised either by openly racist parents or by subtly racist parents and things that we might not even know that we're doing and saying or thinking that um could be affecting perpetuating the problem. So that was kind of the theme of our group.
And I have to tell you, mine was group is the most exciting side of police officer come to the door in the middle of it. And my husband and I were both on calls. Everything's okay, but <laughs> we had the most exciting group. Let me just say now, I don't think we will in this conversation um, be able to say, okay, hey, so what do we do next? Right? Or what should you do now? I do think um, that there will be moments and opportunities over the course of our, our lifetime that will hearken us back to where we are right now. Right? I mean, you know, it's, the, it's, the, it's all of the engagement, all the learning, and then you'll have an opportunity. Um, both as an individual, I'd offer, and and then potentially as a you know as a community and as a nation, and we'll know it. Um, you will, we'll know it when it's happening. I mean, I think that's that's what I'll offer on the most like, like philosophical time, philosophical um, from the most philosophical philosophical vantage point. Uh, and there will be some specific things over the next few years as we are organizing our strategy around how do we close the racial wealth gap in the greater Washington region, that we're gonna come back to you with, you know, with, with notions about where we're going as a foundation and where we want you all to, um, to go with us so that we're moving beyond the conversation um, to, to, to real action, to real investment, to real movement in community. So uh, I'm just inviting you to stay the course with us um, as we're just starting out on this journey and we just want you to, you know, to come along with us. Um, Our group had. Andy. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Andy. Go ahead, Andy. Okay, so I, I want to I want to say that in an imperfect world, I think there are things we can do now. Um, and I'm I I'm one guy, and I'm doing a couple things. So I just want to put out there that I whatever your place in life, whether you're an employer or whether you're a volunteer or whatever, there there are things to do even now. So I'll just tell you a couple of things I'm doing. And um, and I imagine there are many others that I'm not, there, there are many others I'm not even aware of. But for instance, I'm involved, my company is offering pro bono support to the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity in Montgomery County. So we've made that our pro bono project for the year. We've given a ton of support to them in terms of raising awareness and trying to influence the, the uh, school board and the superintendent of schools and principals and the educational system in Montgomery County. Um, I am certain uh, that, they, that the coalition could use extra support in terms of bodies and particularly people who would be interested in getting invested in advocacy to do something about um, basic equity for uh, black and brown people uh, in the educational system in Montgomery County. So that's, that's the thing that's, that's happening uh, right now. Um, there's also, there are also some sort of preliminary discussions going on that are for me unformed, but they're happening around how to deal with the uh, antagonism around critical race theory in the schools. And, um, you know, knowing that, that there is non-hateful opposition to this. There are people who are, you know, knee-jerk, I'll call them haters for the sake of some other word, but there are other people who aren't. And how, how do the lessons of critical race theory and the revisiting of American history get raised in a way that can go down better um, with, quote, white independence. I'm using a political term. So I'm involved in a group that's talking about that, and thinking through how that might happen. It's very preliminary. It's not organized. It's a couple of people talking, but people who are trying to think about what we might do and how we might bring groups together to have those conversations and maybe influence um, education. Um, some of the stuff is indirect. For example, my own, my own uh, philanthropic interest is primarily in the food space. So it's not anti-racist per se, but who, who are we trying to deal with or support, engage um, around um, uh, food insecurity and anti-hunger initiatives? 99% are people of color. 
um, and you know, a large percentage are black people. So that's not an anti-racist activity per se along these lines of conversation, but my philanthropic investment is geared towards opportunity and fairness and equity and speaking out on that. So, I mean, I could name other things, but I think there are things we can do. I mean, I'm an employer. I do, I try to do lots of things through my work, which is a whole other conversation, but I think there are things we can do. And I think, I think it's worth coming off a conversation like this, hearing what Tony is saying that we're going to be called upon someday, or we're going to know someday that it's time to step up. But in the interim, I think we should really think hard about what we can do um, to get our muscles moving and feel like we're actively engaged beyond the learning we're doing. So that's just a small statement. Thank, thanks, Andy. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Andy. Um, I want to invite uh, Jordan to jump in. I just got a, a hand wave from Tonya claiming that their group was lit too, and that, uh, and that some, there were some things that uh, got said in that group that we may want to share here in the big room. Jordan, you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, thank you, Ronnie. Um, can folks hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, my name is Jordan. I use they and he pronouns. Um, this is my first discussion um, with this collective, and I'm grateful for the for the space that y'all have created today. Um, a couple things I had offered in our smaller group were really just uh, what Michelle had offered us around government policies and re remembering that the federal, state, and local government were not only involved, whether drafting or complicit in creating and structuring systems of power and oppression. Um, and that wasn't something, that's not a North versus South issue. That was a all across this land that is referred to as the US issue. Um, I also wanted to, I also offered um, some framing that I've, I've gotten from former colleagues um, around really acknowledging and, and remembering uh, the quote unquote founding of America was really through stolen land, stolen labor, stolen lives, and stolen resources. And so as we think about reparations and the, the things that Michelle offered to us, continuing to hold that um, as we engage in this conversation and thinking through today, what is our, not only what can we do, um, but who needs to be central or centered in that conversation. Um, and I think with that, it's really important that we not just continue to, to follow what has been done before because we're still continuing to produce the same outcomes, um, but how do we really center people who are most impacted by systems of, of power and oppression um, and make sure that they're not being invited to a table to as one person or as two people to, to share a thought, but really that they are creating a new table um, and the ones who have decision-making power um, and that we follow the lead of those folks. Um, and Tammy, I really appreciated the comment that you put into the chat around race and disability and the intersections of those. Um, and it, it really had me thinking about uh, the collective work of uh, the Kambahi River Collective, which I'm not sure if folks are familiar with their work. That was a group of black queer feminists who came together in the 1970s. They have a really short um, collective statement um, where no word is wasted. Um, and the analysis and framework that they offer to us is incredibly intersectional um, and speaks of things that we have only imagined. And it's a more than 50 year old framework. Um, and it lays out a pathway or an offering of a, of a pathway of how we can, how we could progress um, to not just make change one with one person, but really how we think about changing the material conditions um, in our lifetimes. 
So I, I just wanted to share that offering from our group um, and Ronnie, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Well, maybe your group was the, the lit group. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for that, Jordan. And the and the, the reminder from you and Tammy about intersectionality. And if you could, Jordan, I see it already. Could you please uh, drop that uh, in the chat box about the collective? I think that is a wonderful framework for us to consider. We, just, we have a few more minutes before we wind down. Um, and to this question that Bobby raised, I think around like, all of this stuff is happening as it relates to racial equity, racial justice and inclusion, lots of conversation and learning and things of the like. Um, what does, what like, what do we do with all that? Like what, like, what do we do as a consequence of all that? So I just wanna offer just a couple of framing remarks to that question as we, we go forward. So, um, and we, we had this conversation inside of the foundation, um, inside of our foundation. Uh, this, this is action, but it's not the kind of action that Bobby's talking about. There's like, what do we do with all of this that's happening? But this, this is action, bringing folks together across race, across jurisdictions, across sectors to have this conversation, that is action, right? And it reminds me of um, work that was happening during the 50s and 60s during the civil rights movements, with an S, um, where um, before they would actually go out into the street, there was actually a lot of political education happening, a lot of conversation, a lot of dialogue, a lot of mind changing. And as a matter of fact, right before they went into the street, they would actually go into a church and you would have the preachers come, they would pray and they would sing and like all, they would like uh, analyze what was happening all of that was a part of getting it kind of getting as Beyonce would say, I love quoting Beyonce these days, by the way, um, Beyonce would say all of that was about getting into formation. That's what we're doing right now. We're getting into formation um, so that when we get, when we actually take the next step in our action, we're aligned, we're in solidarity, and we are doing it in the most powerful way. Right, and so I'm feeling this level of urgency about okay, what's next? And I, I, I'm I'm glad for that. And one question that I have is, and we saw Michelle do this in the article. In the first article, she says, "I used to be neutral about these things." This is a black woman who heard stories about her great great grandmother. Remember that story? She said, "I used to be neutral about these things," but then George Floyd happened. She said it. It's right there at the top of the first article. And so my question to this group, I have a couple, and to our larger community, um, what, is, what is the moment that you're kind of like, aha moment, that made you go, uh-oh, there's something else here. I need to change the way that I have been moving on this issue. That's the question for us personally. And then the other big question is, is our community, and I'm talking about the greater Washington region, are we really ready for this? Are we really ready for some of the truths that have, we've been unearthing on this call? Are we ready to internalize and be those truths and be motivated by those truths? And to Jordan's point, and to hear those truths out of the mouths of the folks in our community who have been suffering the most. Are we ready for that, right? And I would say there's probably some parts of our community that might be ready and there are other parts who are actively resisting what's happening here, the fight, with critical race theory, the invasion of the Capitol on, and I use the word invasion, right? On January 6th, like these are signals that our community, our society is still debating about these things. So the question I have is, are we ready for this? And what does it take uh, to get ready? And so I, you know, I've been talking to my colleague, Anna, uh, at the foundation about this. And, and Anna, I know you have a little bit of perspective. I wonder if you'd be willing to share it this morning about like, how do you move from like, noticing to like, oh, I'm being called to take action. Sure, um, so I'm gonna go on a, just a bit of a tangent um, just for a moment, but go with me. Uh, so a couple of years ago, I had a four month old baby and one of my dear friends was having her baby dedicated at church. And I was running late and it was raining in spring when it was cold. And 
our church, the way you got in, if you uh, to get into the accessible um, entrance, was sort of a side door, but kind of around a corner, not the main entrance. And I went and I got up to the door and I started ringing the bell and banging on it, and nobody let me in because the front desk, front uh, desk staff was was off somewhere else, and the music was going because again I was late, <laughs> and no one could hear me. I banged on a bag and I had to take my jacket and cover the bassinet so that way my, my baby wouldn't get wet and no one came. So I had to go down, which made me even more late, down all the way around, go back to the main entrance, pick up the bassinet and hoist my baby up slippery marble steps to walk in and get to the door. Completely missed the baby dedication that I had come for. And I am soaking wet. I look like I've been swimming. And I am pissed. I was so furious. And I would say only 2% of that was mild annoyance of the front desk staff for not being there at the door. Cause I know they're busy and I know stuff comes up. I was mostly mad at myself. I have a really dear friend named Judith and her husband uh, has had cerebral, cerebral palsy and needed a wheelchair. And so that entrance that was how they always got into the building. And she had told me for years of, of them out in the dark and out in the snow and the cold banging on the door and nobody let them in. And she told me about schlepping across DC on buses to show up for a board meeting only to find that someone had scheduled it, booked it on the second floor. There was no elevator. So there was no way they could even get there. This happened to them time and time again. And, you know, I, I felt like I'd been doing my part of like making sure my meeting was scheduled on the first floor, making sure I was there to open the door. But I hadn't actually taken real meaningful action to change the system, change the structure, the literal structure. And I was, I was mad at myself for not doing more before. And I was ashamed that it took experiencing it myself before I really got it and decided to take action. And in listening to people over the last year, I think, I think George Floyd was, was that moment for a lot of people. And it provoked those, those feelings of I, I haven't done enough or I wanna do more and I don't know where to go. And I just wanna say as a, as a sort of a first step on this journey, feel all the feelings. That's okay. We need to be able to process. We need to connect with people and talk it through and then learn and, and talk some more. That's, that's a really, really important point as Ronnie brought up. But the trouble is when a goal is so big that you can't just, you know, fairy godmother this problem away. You can't just throw all the money you want at it and fix it. It can, it can make it feel really overwhelming. It can feel, um, you can feel defeatist. And if all you're doing is talking and feeling and talking and feeling and learning and talking and feeling and learning, after a while you, you start to feel like you're spinning in circles, like you're, you're lost in the wilderness. So how do you get out of the wilderness? Same as anyone from the history of time has gotten out of the wilderness. You find a tribe. You have to find your tribe that is gonna help, that you can help and you can join in getting out of the wilderness. And then to take that, that, real, that really meaningful step, you have to really look inward and figure out what are you willing to commit to moving toward a brighter, better vision, a, a better future. So circling back to my, um, my church story, what I immediately did was raise my hand to volunteer for the capital campaign. There, I didn't, I didn't need to create a tribe because there was already a group of people who understood the problem and they were getting going. There were, there were plans in the works, there was structure and I could just dive right in. But they wouldn't let me go and ask anybody for money or host a party or do anything like that until I first made my commitment to the capital campaign. And that meant sitting down and even though we were just starting our family and you know strategizing about what we wanted to do, um, we had to come up with a number that felt generous and felt 
felt important, you know, given given the gravity of, of the, the situation and, and, and our vision and how we felt about it. And I remember at the time we got to this number and my husband said, okay, are you sure? Because it was the biggest charitable commitment we had ever made. And I said, yes. I can't look that baby in the eye with integrity without knowing that I did everything that I can to make this possible. And yeah, it means tightening my belt and some some of the nice to haves, not the, you know, not core essential, but it meant I would put off some things that I had been looking for, but I didn't feel deprived because I was so excited about what I was helping to build. So in, order, in addition to seeing that beautiful building come about, what I couldn't have predicted was how the process of volunteering, the process of digging deep, the process of asking my peers to give money, asking my, looking my peers in the eye and asking them for three times my annual salary. I had never done that before. That was a transformative experience for me. I wouldn't have the job I have today if I hadn't done that. I wouldn't have the community, the bigger, more inclusive community that stood by my family when my father died, that, that supported us through, throughout the pandemic. I wouldn't have had all of that if I hadn't dug deep. So just to recap, <laughs> the three steps, and it's not a linear journey. It's, 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 uh, it's something that we'll continue to revisit. Are you in this space where you're feeling all the feelings and you're learning? What do, you, what do you need more to learn to feel like, like you, you have the knowledge that you have to advance? Number two, have you found your tribe yet? I know you're part of the Community Foundation's tribe and we love that, but have you really found your like inner circle tribe where you're connecting with people and you, you guys are working towards a vision? Um, and then finally, you know, whoever you are, wherever you are on your journey, there is something that you uniquely can bring to this work, your gifts, your talent, your life experience, your, your questions, um, and yes, money. <laughs> um, but yes, there's something we all can bring to this. Have you had that, that thought to think, that, that deep introspection to think, what am I willing to bring? And with that, I'll turn it back to Ronnie. Thanks, Anna. And um, this, as I, listen, as I listen to that story, it, it, one, it's interesting, we were talking about the intersection of race and disability and how that story actually kind of um, lends itself to that intersection. Um, but also, I'm also, I can see you and your husband sitting there at the table uh, thinking about, and we're not asking for money today, y'all, so don't reach for your uh, pocketbooks. Um, but it does provoke a question. We were thinking about what are we going to give? The question that comes up for me is, what are we as a community willing to sacrifice and put on the line in order to like move these issues of race and economy, particularly racial wealth gap? Because it is going to cost us all something, right? And so, um, sorry, so I, that's a question, that's a deep question for us uh, to think about uh, as we leave this place. Like, yes, all the learning and community building, and what is this gonna cost us? Um, what am I willing to put on the line um, around these issues? And hopefully that question has been provoked for y'all. So what happens next? So we've been learning, we've been talking, we looked at Michelle's um, 10 part series, we broke into small groups, um, we've had discussion. What, what happens next? What do we do with all this? So here's where we're trending. Um, so one, we wanna invite you back. A next book group will be in February um, and we'll look at this list of uh, suggestions um, to see what we can do together, um, what we can read together. But between now and then, we, are, we wanna get much more um, uh, intentional about setting a cross-racial, cross-sector um, learning journey uh, uh, we're a uh, tribe, if you will, that is moving toward action to close the racial wealth gap. And um, for us, that is not just us getting together on Zoom calls, but it's also us being in conversation and rotation and community in the neighborhoods 
with the people who are suffering the most at the bottom end of the racial wealth gap. And so we are a community foundation and we believe that our unique superpower is bringing folks together across lines of difference. And we're looking for folks, uh, and some of you I've identified you on this call uh, today to help us design and launch uh, that effort. So hopefully y'all will do that with us, allow us to follow up with you um, to just do a quick survey to see how this space went and how we can uh, make it better. And as you leave this uh, time, together today. We hope that you are both quickened in your imagination, uh, challenged, and to the uh, question that got asked, and like, what does this moment require of me and us? What action are we willing to take beyond uh, this moment? Hopefully all of those things are coming up for you. And if there's um, one word that you could share with us that uh, kind of expresses the spirit of what you've experienced today and what you're carrying, forward into the weekend. Um, if you could share that in the chat box, we will use those words as our departing um, benediction, if you will. Um, so if you could share those in the chat box. Thank y'all so much again for joining us for this third book talk. Please allow us again to be in touch with you um, on the survey and to invite some of you to join us in the design of our path going forward. Have a great uh, rest of the Friday and a great rest of the week. Bless y'all.